Hello there, good evening. Um, lately I saw the winner announced for the National Book Award for Translated Fiction, or Literature, I forget, but this American award for translated stuff. And the winner was this one, Tokyo Ueno Station, which I did talk about uh, on this channel when I read it back in summer. But um, I kind of felt that like my thoughts have changed or maybe developed or solidified a bit since then. And also like watching the announcement, there were a few things which kind of um, I don't know, made me see the book in a new light. For example, the title, I, I noticed that the Japanese title is different from the English title, which isn't unusual, but I hadn't thought to look up the Japanese title. And the, it's quite interesting, actually. The Japanese title is uh, J.R. Ueno Eki uh, Koen Guchi. So, like, uh, Ueno Station Park Exit. Uh, not Tokyo Ueno Station. And uh, first of all, this kind of made me think, like, I think it's, I feel like it's more like probably something to do with the editor than the translator that would do this to the, the title. Because there was that other book recently, uh, Strange Weather in Tokyo, which was like really popular. And you see it on YouTube a lot. Um, and that's like, you know, by, by, by Kawakami Hiromi, I think. And uh, yeah, the, the original title is like Sensei's Bag. It's like Western publishers just need to put the word Tokyo in there. I don't know why they think that like, you know, if we don't see the word Tokyo in a Japanese book, we're not going to be interested in reading it or something. It's odd. So Tokyo is one thing. But um, apart from the Tokyo thing, uh, much more like importantly for me was the park exit thing. Because I remember when I was reading this, I was curious about the title because the station doesn't play a big role in it. Um, this It's the park outside the station where the main, where almost, well, a lot of the, well, kind of technically all the action takes place. Okay, I should give a synopsis. It's about a homeless person uh, living in the park outside Ueno Station, Ueno Park, um, and he's dead. Um, so it's like his his ghost or what's left of his thoughts um, kind of just lingering around the park and reflecting on his life and like kind of stream of consciousness going in and out of his memories and the uh, sort of uh, impressions of the park and people that go by and so on. So the whole book is really in the park and talks about the history of the park and um, people coming and going through the park and the museum in the park and everything, everything, everything is about the park. Um, and so that's like park should really be in the title and the, the station hasn't got much to do with it. Then there's the exit thing, right? Like the and the station, a park exit is like, you know, the exit that will lead into the park. And that is literally what has happened. He has died and exited life and gone into the park where he was already living. So like the, the idea of that he's like stuck in this unresolved exit is like the whole thing again through the book. So park exit, Ueno Park Exit would be such a good title. I, I mean, it is a good title. It makes so much sense and it like fits all the themes of the book really well. Whereas uh, Tokyo Ueno Station, I, d I just feel like it's it's just just feel like it doesn't really connect with the text or do anything special. But anyway, that's marketing probably. So um, the actual translation is amazing, um, done by Morgan Giles. And the language is like so crisp and precise and like poetic and reads, and like I said, it's stream of consciousness, but there's often like little little details that are just taken out and put by themselves on lines, all to themselves. And, and often I don't like that, but in, in this book, it, it really worked, I thought. So um, the, the actual text itself is... It's pretty gorgeous, I thought. I also kind of realized though, like I think reading, like thinking about this, I think maybe stream of consciousness novels just aren't for me. It's weird for me because like, I think like I should like stream of consciousness. It seems like it should gel kind of with my character and stuff that I like. Um, but I, I, I don't like Virginia Woolf. Don't tell anyone I don't like Virginia Woolf. I read Mrs. Dalloway and the Waves and um, um, The Lighthouse to The Lighthouse. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of similar to this one, like this kind of reminds me a bit of Mrs. Dalloway in a way. Um, it's got like, you know, like a short kind of enclosed space, but it's moving through all like these different impressions and stuff. And there's some beautiful bits of writing and beautiful, like strange moments that appear when like kind of shifting from one impression or kind of uh, image into a thought or memory or personal kind of opinion or I don't know. It just there's some great bits in it, but I guess as a whole, I haven't ever read a stream of consciousness book like that's all the way through a stream of consciousness um, that I really liked or connected with. Uh, I haven't read Ulysses. Maybe that'll change things, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, back to this book. So yeah, kind of like I said, there's these little impressions to do with nature and stuff that come out like just looking at some sparrows or uh, looking at some paintings in and in the park museum, which he can enter as a ghost. Um, which were really like stunningly written in like 
beautiful little bits of prose that just like kind of jumped out and that that was great but when it actually went into the memories like his past and his life and how he came to be here i mean like a lot of the tension i guess of the plot is trying to see how his present situation as a homeless ghost connects to his uh life well, like that he's remembering like how did he end up here basically um and those memory bits i just didn't find very engaging at all uh with the exception i guess of like little bits like there's this uh, he's part of a minority a buddhist minority um and they talk a bit about their discrimination and stuff and they talk about this uh chant they uh this funeral chant and that chant gets like repeated over and over and it gets it gives the text like a kind of rhythmic quality like this chant to sort of help people into the afterlife has just like kind of interspersed itself at different bits of his life and also like of his afterlife um and it's yeah it, it kind of adds some sort of music to the to the words and 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 i really like that um that kind of yeah rhythmic repetition but um yeah apart from that the memory stuff and like actually his whole life i didn't really find interesting i didn't really connect with him or engage with him uh his, his name's kazu by the way uh, this character, yeah. So um, it goes through his life and it connects it to Japanese history. So he works as a laborer for the 1964 uh, Tokyo Olympics, um, doing like construction, like building the athletic equipment and stuff. And then um, his son is born on the same day as the emperor's son. And there's some other coincidences between him and the emperor. And so like that kind of comes through. And there's this sort of sense of like a parallel between his life, which is pretty sad and unlucky and tragic, um, like mirroring the national life of the country. So there's this Japanese like filmic tradition because I know like a bit about Japanese cinema. So like there's a filmic tradition of doing this thing of having like the nation's history uh, presented through the eyes of ordinary people um, and then like sort of contrasting their day-to-day -day, like mund mundane things with the big events of Japanese history um, like modern history and um, like there's some brilliant films that do this there's like Insect Woman by Imamura Shohei there's uh, Gishiki or I guess it's called Ceremonies by Oshima Nagisa and they you know they they what they do is they have this this sense of outrage and absurdity often um, like, for example, end of World War II radio announcement, uh, the main character is having sex. Or, you know, like, there's there's certain things that are reflected and refracted through the characters, and often they're totally at odds with, like, the official version of events. Um, so this gap between ordinary people and, like, official national history, and also the ways that they connect is really, like, can be, like, explored and has, a like, a strong, like, presence in Japanese popular culture. The reason I'm saying all that is because I didn't get that from this book at all. This book is like kind of going for a more subtle, wry, ironic connection. And I think like maybe I'm just not attuned to that. And of course, it's not fair to like compare it to those things uh, like that I that I do like. Um, but it, it does do like or it seems to be trying to do a similar thing. Like the fact that he's a laborer for the Olympics, like it just seems kind of ironic. And there isn't like like it actually says here on the in the from the inside bit. Da, da, da. It says, uh, blah, blah, blah. living in the parks, vast homeless villages, traumatized by the destruction of the 2011 tsunami and enraged by the announcement of the 2020 Olympics. Like there was no rage. I didn't feel any rage, really. Just like kind of despondency and uh, like sadness, loneliness um, and kind of resignation, I guess, you know, like this is like a really kind of depressing book. And there isn't like a sense of outrage, really about these things like when it comes to the fact that he's laboring um and working on the t on the olympics and the olympics is meant to be like a moment of national pride and yet um you know like for him they're, they're not they're just like kind of bookends on a life which didn't have much meaning and also the stuff with the, the the emperor right like i didn't feel like the book is trying to say that it's you know like kind of outrageous that these two people who seem to be kind of connected in this uh coincidental way uh, are like kind of separate they're both citizens of the same society but they're separated by you know you know totally different lives and they have totally different amounts of like privilege and opportunities and wealth and so on um it's not like angry about that i think at least i didn't feel any anger in this like as well as that little blurb the, i was drawn to this book by the premise because it sounds already like it's it's got an implicit critique in it this the idea of it's about a ghost who, who's homeless and who's just like you know He's been living his life aimlessly in a park and now he's living his death aimlessly in a park and he's invisible to everybody 
and it's like nothing has changed and that's already like a really interesting idea and premise and starting point like that's about as direct as it gets in its critiques of society i think and you know like i do think that if you take something like homelessness as a main theme which this book does obviously it's you know it talks about homelessness and not a lot then i feel like you're kind of taking on a bit of responsibility in how you portray it since you know you're you're not just talking about the life of a homeless guy although for a lot of that you know it is just a guy who happens to be homeless and that's fine as well um you know i'm not i don't want to be misunderstood i'm not saying like if you write about like homeless people then you need to write like a social treatise or something like that it's just that i do think that this novel wants like to be pushing forward some sort of uh, critique of society but it also doesn't have the the guts to really go there if that makes sense i mean kazu doesn't need to feel a sense of outrage i guess but the book i feel does if it's talking about you know this this like big problem that you have in a in one of the world's leading economies where people can't afford to uh house themselves and you know get basic shelter and then once they end up in that situation like all the difficulties that arise um we had uh stories uh recently for a typhoon about homeless people who were turned away from uh, shelters, like typhoon shelters, not homeless shelters, typhoon shelters that everybody was uh, getting into, you know? Like, it doesn't matter your wealth, the shelters were for everyone, but because the homeless people didn't have addresses, they couldn't be registered, and so they were turned away. Now, that's unusual, and it was, like, kind of national news, um, but it's the kind of thing that, like, I think provokes a sense of injustice, and, like, that, I felt, was really kind of missing from this. Like, as the novel goes on, it becomes clear that so much of his uh, fate and the bad things that happened to him are really down to unluckiness and, like, you know, some poor decisions and just, like, kind of sad things like death and things that couldn't be avoided, basically. Um, and that I, does, I do feel that undermines some of, like, the social aspect of this book. I did look up Yumiri as well and it's interesting because she has you know like had gotten threats from right-wingers and had to cancel book events and stuff like that not because of this book but because of stuff in the past and um, she is a uh, Zainichi Japanese so that means that she has got like Korean ancestry um, and uh, yeah it's there's a whole history about why that needs to be a separate category of identity rather than just Japanese but basically you know there's a lot of racist people in the world who you know like don't like her books and the thing kinds of things she talks about um, and so I did kind of wonder if like the fact that this is indirect could it be maybe a self-preservation thing you know like maybe writing some like things that could be read as anti-nationalist or like really harsh against the state uh could be dangerous for you if you're the, somebody who gets targeted by by right-wingers um you know like and that's a whole other social issue that should have a novel about it like uh right-wing extremism or no threats of right-wing extremism in japan because like there isn't actually much right-wing extremist violence but like there's often the threat of things like uh you know like terrorist attacks and bombs and stuff are often like have a disproportionate effect on society like uh closing down museum exhibits uh showing korean comfort women stuff that was a big deal recently um mu uh, museums and what else uh, universities like profess having to like shut down uh, the university that I went to closed down because of an internet bomb threat. It's like the amount of influence that like far right thought has through the internet is like something which I think a lot of people don't know about Japan and like a lot of people just take it for granted here. Why is this book over here? Oh, because I'm going to read it later. That's why. Okay. Uh, what was I saying? Uh, you, Miri. Yeah. So I do kind of feel like it's a uh, like, I don't know if it's true or anything. I just, I just wondered if maybe there was actually practical reasons for not making the case so directly that, you know, Japanese society has some very big problems in it. So finally, I want to talk about Fukushima because Fukushima is something else that's like a big important thing for the book because the guy, Kazu, is from Fukushima and uh, like there's little references to it and it's not a big event like in the plot, but kind of like the, the ghosts, um, I shouldn't use that word really, the ghost of Fukushima is like hovering over the, the text all the way through. Um, there's this, you know, like I said, it's a pretty despondent and sad book and it like looks at history in a sad way. And the thing about Fukushima, right, like the incident, is that it can be looked in at and talked about and thought about in like basically two ways as a natural disaster, you know, which it was a big tsunami, uh, which killed lots of people. Um, or as a man-made disaster, which it also was, you know, it was a nuclear meltdown and uh, it was uh, afterwards, there was a lot of 
issues with things like communication and getting people to safety and also sending vulnerable people, including homeless people, to do cleanup work, you know, at the risk of radiation poisoning and all sorts of like really outrageous stuff went on in the aftermath of Fukushima, which was very much like a social thing, right? So the fact that Fukushima like can be divided into just like, you know, just some natural thing which we have no control over and the failings of society, I thought in that sense that kind of hung over this book. Um, and again, I did feel it, lent to, it leans towards this kind of just, you know, in Japan you say shogunai, which means like it can't be helped. Like that's that's life. No, it's, it's, it's shitty and bad things happen in it. Like the inability to take care of your own citizens, I think, is like something which is a really important part of the theme of this book and of course of Fukushima as well. Um, and it just doesn't really get talked about. So, like, I found that really frustrating, to be honest, like, reading it. And it's a short little book, as you can see, and always I felt like just skirting around that that issue of responsibility. There's one scene, um, without spoiling, that the actual Fukushima disaster does kind of enter the plot of the novel in an important way. And in that scene, I think it's really telling that I feel it, it veers towards natural disaster rather than social disaster you know it's very much about the, the the wave rather than the the failings of people to to deal with uh the the dispossessed and the people who were made vulnerable um by the the wave and the nuclear meltdown and stuff so basically it didn't leave a huge impact on me and i think that's largely because i just didn't connect with the character at all like kazu uh which is a shame because so much of it was about his life um the things that did leave an impact on me were these little little moments that were like scattered throughout um, but as a whole it didn't really work and that's a shame because you know it deals with it's such an important book and it deals with such important issues that you know like to to get this prize and to be get this wide readership I do feel like it, it could it could be doing a bit more if that makes sense but that said um, as I kind of like suggested a little uh, vaguely before but like I do feel that maybe it's a bit more radical in a Japanese context um, one reason is because I found out that it was written in the Fukushima dialect. So that's something that would be lost um, on English readers, I guess. Like the fact that all the way through, uh, if you're reading it in Japanese, you'd be feeling the sense that you're hearing a Fukushima person's voice. So even more that would kind of like add the sense of the Fukushima tragedy into it. And if people already have this sense of Fukushima being this sort of national disaster, then just connecting those feelings to homelessness could like you know be a sort of revolutionary thing in itself if that makes sense so yeah there there could be a lot of stuff in this that I missed you know like just because of language or because uh, of my own you know reading style or whatever um, that actually do make it more of a like yeah like a, a radical book in that sense so yeah if you can draw connections between Fukushima and homelessness as you know like huge societal tragedies um, and also just to sort of relatable things like uh, mundane beauty and loneliness, uh, which, you know, is like really strong in the novel, then uh, then that's great. Um, and I did overall enjoy the, the book. I gave it four stars on Goodreads and I'm not going to change that because, like I said, there were just really beautiful passages throughout um, and beautiful little turns of phrase, which I think um, are a lot to do with uh, the translation um, and being able to, you know, like, change that Japanese into English in a way which still reads as like really uh, impressive uh, even in a different language so uh, yeah well done to Morgan Giles and well done to you Miri for winning that prize and uh, yeah I hope that uh, most of all I hope that it gets more you Miri stuff translated into English because I would definitely love to read more um, maybe the stream of consciousness thing is for me I don't know yet but I definitely want to read more by her I do really like a lot of this and I think a lot of people would like this so you know I'm a Philistine who doesn't like Mrs. Dalloway so you know if you like Virginia Woolf maybe you'll absolutely love this maybe like I said it's just the form that doesn't really work for me uh, in combination with the, the the way that it deals with social stuff but um but anyway yeah I think a lot of people would like this so if it sounds like it's uh something that would be interesting for you then yeah give it a give it a shot it's very melancholy short uh breezy it's like a dream it's like uh like you know going through somebody else's dream of their life uh, and it's a pretty sad life. Uh, but yeah, that's Tokyo Inner Station. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.